Okay, uh, any questions before we get uh, get going? Sorry again, I'm late. Let me get up chat. All right, we'll jump in. So last time we started uh, looking at cash, um, just to recall, Again, why we need it, there's a big gap in performance between memory and processors, and it's growing wider and wider. So this necessitates some creative things, namely cache. We talked last time about uh, some reasons why it's fast, implementation details for, for why we need it, as well as this memory hierarchy. And um, we, we talked about the principle of locality, and why this is this is absolutely critical that we're taking advantage of locality in our program um, so that we can uh, actually take advantage of what the cache gives us because this the cache is a small subset of our actual full memory space we need to have some sort of locality to give us performance gains um, then we did this whole example that's way too long and then we got into these four fundamental questions uh, about caches. And this is where um, we, we were at the end. We, were, we discussed block placement, um, which is where the cache line, where our block, data block can be placed in the cache. Um, we t the next question that we have is, um, how, do we, uh, how do we know if um, uh, a block exists in our cache, and how do we find find where it is? Um, and then we'll talk about this today as well. Which blocks should be replaced when we do have a miss? This, uh, obviously, since our cache is smaller than the full memory space, uh, sometimes we'll need to get rid of old, stale uh, blocks and replace them with new ones so that we can take advantage of the uh, new locality that we have for, for the current execution context. Um, and then we'll talk about at the end, write strategy, which is what do we do when we have a write to the cache? Okay. Um, let's see here. So we, we did the few examples of how, uh, uh, how cache geometry works. Um, and we ended here, yeah? Any questions on that whirlwind review? On the worksheet or any, any of the stuff there? Yes. I know when we're reading from memory, we try and hit cache first and then go out to hit until we have a hit or a rate. When we're writing, do we also have that? Great question. So the so the question was we have a hit rate um, when we're reading. Do we also have that when we're writing to to memory? Um, So it, it actually depends. Uh, for the most part, we're going to assume that yes. Um, so like for the homework, assume yes. Uh, but you could create a memory system where that's not the case, but they don't really, uh, I don't think they're very common. Any other questions? Oh, I have a question. Uh, mm -hmm. So, given a, a, a cache block, uh, if we have the uh, index and offset in that index, we can already find the location in the cache. So, why do we need the tag? Why do we need the tag if we already have the index and the offset? This is a great question. Let's go back to, I guess, let's see here. So. What does the tag give us? Why do, we, why do we need it at all? Well, 
So we have, if let's just say that this is our entire memory space, it's 32 blocks of memory. Um, but our cache is only eight, okay? So down here, we, we have eight cache lines that we can fill up. Now, uh, if we have either the set associative case here or fully associative, uh, we'll, what will happen is that we'll be able to place block 12 in this case in two different places. Block, block 12 can go into either zero or one uh, of this cache because um, block 12 should fall into the set zero, but then it could be in either one of these places, okay? And we have to figure out, um, the, the, the problem is that there's other things that could also fall into this, right? A zero could fall into this set, four could fall into this set, eight, 12, any of the multiples of, of four can be in set zero, which means that we don't know like that for sure that this one's 12 or that this one's 12. We have to check the tag, which, uh, which gives us the rest of the information. This only tells us that it's uh, a multiple of four and then we have to know which multiple of four it is. That's what the tag tells us. Um, and then uh, the same, I guess the same, the same does apply here as well, right? So with direct map, um, any multiple of eight can fall in, or any multiple of like eight offset by four can fall into this. Uh, and so um, it could be either four, 12, or, you know, um, a, a few other numbers that I don't want to compute because I'm bad at math, um, could fall into this four and you have to compare the tag to see if it's, if it's the one that we want. Okay. Did that help? Yeah, yeah, it did. Thank you. Excellent. Excellent. Okay. Um, other questions? Uh, this is very important to to have have down before we move on for sure. So. I don't really know how to approach problem three from the homework. Could we talk about that a bit? We'll, we'll talk about that later. Okay. I think uh, I'll, I'll kind of once we're once we're through the slides, I'll go back and talk a little bit about the homework and the project. So uh, we'll, we'll do that at the end. Mm, okay, let's move on to the third problem that we have to figure out a solution for, which is what should we do when we have to replace something in our cache? So when will we have to do this? Well, if the data we want isn't in the cache, so this is like a cache miss, right? Um, we might have to evict, so this is, this is the terminology, eviction, um, a cache line from the cache to make room for the new data. Um, and this is called the cache eviction policy, very creatively. So, the, the times that we do have to evict a line are when uh, the set that we want to put, put it in is full. Um, so if it's two-way set associative and we already have two things in our, in our the set uh, for this cache line, we have to then get rid of one of them to put in the new value. So we'll talk about four different um, policies. Uh, the first one's random. So we just uniformly evict the line. Um, the nice thing is this is really easy to implement, right? I mean, maybe it's pseudo random, but you know, we can have, we can have randomness and that's very easy to implement. Um, and it's not entirely terrible. Um, uh, LRU, which is least recently used. So this is that we evict the line that was accessed the longest time ago. Um, kind of the idea behind this, right, is that if you've accessed it a long time ago, but then didn't access it again for a while, um, it's, you probably aren't going to need it again. Uh, maybe it was just a value that you needed one off, and then you can get rid of it 
evicted from the CAF. Um, this is great for stuff like uh, if you're going through an array, for example, you access index zero, index one, index two. Up oh, now we have maybe we have to evict um, after we access index four and then hit. Uh, we need to put in uh, five index five. Well, let's just get rid of index zero because we're, we're kind of it's pretty obvious we're going through this array. Um, this is a little bit more complicated to keep track of though because uh, you have to keep track of which lines have been accessed when and you have to have an ordering there. Another option is prefer clean. So this is like the same as LRU, except for um, we try and evict clean lines uh, to avoid a write back. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about what write back means in a minute. Um, but the idea is like a clean line is a line that you've only read and not written to. Um, okay, and then the last policy is impossible to implement, um, but it is provably optimal, and it's that you want to evict the line which uh, whose next access is furthest in the future. Right? You, want, you always want this. This is what you want to get to, um, but obviously you cannot predict the future, so we can't really implement this. Um, and yeah, just saying, well, we want to get rid of the thing that uh, is, is not going to be accessed for a long time, and that is going to be provably optimal. Uh, it, I'll, I'll send out at the end of, like later this evening, um, an article about um, like cache replacement policies in Intel processors that was pretty interesting. Um, there was a lot of profiling about how the various eviction policies worked and kind of profiling what the CPU is doing. It doesn't use any of these in case you were wondering. Um, so it's kind of, it's kind of LRU is kind of the idea. Uh, and there's a lot of, a lot of things to do that have been implemented to make it faster to implement as well as just more space efficient and stuff like that. Um, okay. So, um, let's see here. Yeah. The next question is what happens when we write? So we have two main decisions to make. The first decision that we have to make with this is do we just write the cache or to the entire memory hierarchy? Okay, so if you have a, uh, a store word instruction, do you just write that value to the cache or do you write it to the cache, the next level cache and main memory, et cetera? Or do you just write it to the, the first level cache and then wait until it gets evicted to write it out? That's, that's one question that we have to answer. And the second question is, should we pull the cache line into the cache if there's a miss? Um, okay, so let's talk about this first question. Should we just write to the cache or to the entire memory hierarchy? Um, If we don't forward the write, so this would be the first option, we just update the cache. The cache is write back. So this is, the, this is what we call it when you don't, um, uh, uh, when you do not write um, to the higher or lower cache level. And it's right back because it has to be written back. The data has to be written back to the higher level of memory hierarchy or lower level, whichever way you decide to, to do it, um, when we evict from the cache. What this also implies is the cache line can be dirty. This is that state where um, we've, we've written to a cache line. Um, but that 
updated value hasn't been propagated back through the rest of the memory hierarchy. So what are some advantages? Um, well, one for one, we're going to get fewer writes further down our memory hierarchy, um, which means less bandwidth and also which means faster writes. So uh, what, is this, what does this mean? Let's just say we have a program that's doing a sum, right, um, of, a, of a list. And we have a variable that we're just updating constantly. Most likely it's in a register, but let's pretend it's not. Um, if we write to the to that variable and update it with the new values of our array as we're summing, and then each time we do that, it has to propagate all the way through, all the way out to RAM, that's going to be pretty slow. Um, however, if we just allow us to, to hit it in L1 cache um, and update it there, and then after we're done with it and eventually we need to evict it, um, then we're going to only incur the penalty for writing out all the way uh, once. Now, the other option is that we do forward the write onto the lower cache levels. And this is called write through. So we kind of like write here, and then we also go, go through uh, the current cache level into the next cache level. Um, and, and right there as well. Um, and in this case, the nice thing is the cache line is never dirty, right? You're going to have consistent values when you, when you, you know, in RAM as well as your cache level. Um, and the advantage is there's no write back overhead required on eviction, right? So, um, you know, we're going to incur some penalty somewhere. We just have to decide which one, which one is better. All right, questions. Yes. Is there a way to combine them where you have uh, you, you basically wait till there's less utilization and then do a write through. Um, I mean, that's a reasonable idea. I'm not sure if that's implemented anywhere, um, to be perfectly honest. Um, uh, I think, well, actually, there is one. Um, uh, Yeah, I, I'm, I'm honestly not sure. Um, I think that there's there's also there is an idea of potentially using a buffer, a write buffer, to kind of help speed it up. Um, so you have um, you can kind of buffer your writes. Um, I, I, we might actually that might be in the slide. Um, anyway, that is one one idea though. Uh, okay, so this goes to your original question earlier, right, about what do we do when we have a write miss? So we don't have the cache line in our cache, and we have to write uh, to it. So there's, there's, two, there's two options that we have here. Um, uh, the first option is that we pull the cache line into the cache and then write to it. Um, this is called write allocate because we've kind of allocated some space in our cache for this new thing that we wrote to. And then um, the second option is not pulling the line into the cache, obviously. And this is called no write allocate because we're very creative. So what are the advantages of each of, each of these things? Well, uh, for write allocate, it's gonna exploit um, temporal locality. The idea is that data that you uh, write to is likely going to be read pretty quickly. So that read is going to be faster um, since we've already pulled that cache line into the cache. However, uh, no write allocate is not without merit as well because you end up getting less unnecessary evictions. So 
if it's not the case that you're going to read it, it sooner, uh, very, or read the data in the near future, the eviction to allocate this new space for the written line is going to be useless. It's not going to be, uh, it's going to be a waste. Um, so maybe you write a value and then you do a bunch of stuff with, with, uh, uh, that doesn't have to do with that value. And then eventually you go back and read it. It's probably evicted by then. And then you've basically just done unnecessary work. So, um, that is, those are the, the main hash questions that we have to consider. Um, questions on any of those? Jack, yes. How does multi-core stuff affect cash? How does multi-core stuff affect cash? Great question that we will talk about later this semester. Uh, I'll give you a preview. It's hard. And um, generally, it, it, it involves a, a message bus between all the processors to like, make sure you invalidate the right path length is kind of the, the general idea. But yeah, question here. Um, so if like, a right allocate is done, is that considered as a cache? That not being used for what option might have is like you write to that cache, but then could it potentially be immediately removed by like a previously previously used eviction? Um, like if that had been pulled from it yet? Ah, uh, uh, I see. Yes, great question. So, so um, the question the question was basically like if you are doing write allocate, does the allocation count as an access for purposes of LRU? And the answer is yes. Like, um, I mean, I guess technically you could make it not the case that that's, that's what it does, but that doesn't make any sense to me. Um, when you do a right allocate, you're going to consider that to be a access. I think that it's for LRU, um, if we go back, notice that it's access. It's not read. It could be write as well. Excellent questions. Any any others? Um, if you were combining from the first question when you're writing on a cache hit and you are not writing down the memory hierarchy, would then if you were also doing a um, write allocate, would that also be further advantageous then? Um, so you combine a write like allocate with with what again? So if you're combining like the right allocate advantages with the mm -hmm. advantages from question one on um, only writing to the cache, I was just wondering right. if you could like speak to the both of these questions like in combination uh, really. Okay, actually got, got it. So what, what are the kind of combinations, but what are the advantages of various combinations of these two questions, writing to just the cache or uh, doing right allocate versus no right allocate. Um, okay, so let me think about this. Um, I don't really think that it makes sense to have a right through cache that is also like uh, right allocate. In some sense, like it, it, I guess there's there is an advantage that then the next read will be faster, but like um, it makes I think a little bit less sense. Um, let me actually take a note here. I'll I'll get back to you on this. Um, it's a bit I, I don't want to like just be random crap that isn't true. Um, Great question. Um, do most systems use write back or write through? Uh, I think they mostly use write back just because it's so costly to write to all of memory. Okay, there was a question here, I think. Yeah. Um, 
How do we know what we should use? Um, you probably read a bunch of white papers and academic papers written by, <laughs> I, I, I'm not, I would say like, so generally from what I, from what I understand the most processors are right back and right allocate. Right. So you you wouldn't actively choose this as a programmer. This would be something that as an you know maybe like if you're help do working with an electrical engineer or something or building an ASIC for a specific task. This is something that you could consider. You know how do I manage my task? Um, but as a programmer, this wouldn't ever be something that you would you know encounter. And it may honestly, it really. Uh, it's one of those things where you'd have to potentially even just profile your CPU to see what it's actually doing. Um, question here. So the right back, I'm sorry, the right The right miss is, so what is a right miss? The right miss is when you are writing to a block that isn't in your cache. So it doesn't, it doesn't necessarily mean that your cache is full. It just means that it's not in your cache. When I say that it's not in the cache, it means that, I, yeah, it already has data in it, which, it so it likely was evicted at some point, right? Um, and then you're you're writing to it later on. Um, yeah. So when we write, we go right through. When we're reading and we don't have what we're trying to read in the cache, trying to pull it in the cache, do we do it to the full cache or just to a specific memory? Good question. So when we have so when we have a read miss what happens well what happens is oh dear why did i make so many animations um oh, i'm gonna have to go past this thing too um we're gonna pull it all the way through so if it's in memory, we'll, it'll be in. We'll pull it into L3, L2, and L1, and then access it. Um, so the entire hierarchy will have have the new red line. Uh, okay. Any other questions? Explain right back again. Okay. Um, so let we assume that we just have a, a cache line. We don't know how it got there, but we need to write to it. Okay. Um, if it's right back, we only write to that that value to the cache, and we just end there. We don't write. That, that that new value of this this block to L2 or L3 cache, we only write it to L1, and it's called write back because eventually we're going to have to get rid of this line. You know, we're going to run out of space in our cache, and then we're or in the set, and then we're going to have to get rid of it, and that's when we have this write back. We have to write it back a level up into L2, and then kind of. Um, uh, if it's in L2, maybe it stays around and doesn't get written back to L3 until it gets evicted from L L2. Um, but the idea, though, is when we evict, we have to also propagate that update. 
through to the next level. Uh, if we don't, right, like then we have the wrong value in the in the lower level caches, and then it's going to be a problem because then the update didn't actually happen. Yes. I think you said previously, you know, we pull like say you're reading from mem like you know actual memory, right? And you pull all the way up to L1 cache. Yeah. Um, is it tr the same is not true then for a bit, right? Like each cache level essentially has their own policy that they're sort of uh, right. Like so I would say that it's actually kind of the same policy in the sense that on so okay, so the question is basically like. Is it kind of that we have uh, with with reading into it from memory? It seems like there's just one thing we propagate it all the way through uh, all of the levels of cache, but with with writes we maybe do it stepwise per per cache level, and um, the I would I would argue that it's actually the same concept in that on read you look in L1. If it's a myth in L1, you go look at L2. If it's a myth in L2, you go look in L3. And at every level, you just see if it's a myth at that level. And then if it's not, go to the next level and pull pull from it. And so like if you miss an L3, then you're going to out to memory. You grab it from memory. Now it's an L3, so that then L2 can be like, oh, L3 has it. It's, you know, I, I would kind of think of it more along those lines. It's kind of like cascading down each each level, even on on the read. Um, but most definitely that's the case with the right, like going, going back up the hierarchy. Um, does that clarify? Yeah, but I mean, so for like eviction, L1, like an eviction out of L1 does not necessitate an eviction out of L2. Eviction out of L1 does not necessitate an eviction out of L2. That's correct. Yeah. And I would, you know, in a, a read into L2 doesn't actually necessitate a read into L1. So there are prefetchers, we'll talk about that in a week or so, that will prefetch stuff like instructions into L2 instead of L1 so that you can, you know, because maybe they're a little bit uh, more predictable and you're, it's okay to be in L2 and pull them into L1 later. Um, and it helps reduce pollution in L1. So if your eviction system out of L1, then it's just back uh yeah yeah um yeah that's that's kind of the idea like in it uh, you know the l2 is going to be bigger than l1 um so if you evict out of l1 most likely you still have enough room for your new stuff in l2 right so it's okay like maybe you have two two things. It's two-way set associative in L1. It's four-way in L2, and you don't have to evict necessarily um, from L2 when you have to evict from L1. Um, yeah. So that that's the idea. All right. Uh, okay. So let me just check through the questions on Slack. How do we denote write back dirty memory versus clean? Uh, so basically, you just have a a dirty bit that you store alongside your cache line that says, I need to be written back, or I don't need to be written back. And then if it's one, then you have to do the whole write back. Um, yeah, OK. I, I'm going to move move on for now. We can, we can loop back to any questions after we go through the, the, the last few considerations. Um, uh, of some different trade-offs, and then I'll talk about the project and touch on the homework as well. So um, a couple of trade-offs to consider. Associativity is nice, right? If you have associativity, it allows you to put the cache line in a bunch of different places, and that's nice because then you have less probability of having to evict. Um, but the problem is that if you have an n-way associativity, uh, n-way set, set associative cache, you also are going to need n parallel comparators for your tag, because you have to compare the tag against every single one of your 
uh, um, cache lines at the same time. And that's expensive and potentially slow. Like it's technically gonna, you know, you're still probably gonna end up having somewhere on the order of like login, uh, uh, proportional to login that number of transistor is as far as the increase goes um, compared to like just a single line, right? It's gonna be growing log logarithmically at least um, or in login probably. Um, so it's, it's gonna be fairly expensive. And what that means is that since, since we want L1 to be fast and not slow, like this entire point of it, um, most of the time, the associativity of L1 ends up being between two and four or two and eight. Um, but the larger, slower caches are gonna most likely be more associative. So they may have something in a, like eight, 16, um, but they aren't gonna be huge. Um, Intel processors have eight-way L1. Intel Nihalem, I, I couldn't find it in a more up-to-date version because it, it's not like something that they publish. Like it, it's mainly people who have profiled it or have, you know, back in the day, maybe Intel published these. Um, anyway, 18-way 18, 18 for L2 and L3. The core twos have a 24-way uh, um, uh, L2 cast. So it's, it's higher associativity, but it's going to be a little bit slower. But for L1, we want it to be fast. It's going to be very, fairly small associativity. Ideally, right, like if you're implementing a cache in software, you just use a hash table, right, more or less. And we just assume that that's just always going to be fast. The hash is O of one, and we're fine. You don't have that luxury in a CPU. You can't you can't really can't really make that assumption. Why is the associativity not a power of two? I have no idea. Ask the engineers at Intel. Um, I kind of wonder the same thing because it, it makes it, it seems like it would be harder, but I also have, you know, Intel's is very big company with very smart people that probably know what they're doing. Hopefully. Yes, here. Great question. So the, the question was, um, there's, it, what are the advantages of having shared caches between processors and non-shared, like per, per cache? Well, so the first, if you, if you share all of your caches, the biggest advantage is you never have to deal with cache coherence. You never have to worry that the cache in processor one is different than the cache in processor two. And so you never have any issues of like, shoot, we have the wrong value and we're computing on the wrong value when we're doing parallel computing. That's great. The problem is it's gonna be, it's just gonna be physically further away. And so you're gonna, your, your cache is gonna be slower. Your L1 will have to be, necess will necessarily be slower because, um, uh, you know, um, Yeah, it's just for, it's further away. And I think that a lot of modern processors have L1 and L2, which are per core, and then L3, which is shared. And then obviously the memory bus is shared. Um, because at the point you're getting to L3, like you're getting to the point where you're like almost in memory, like as far as like, we, we just want it to be fairly, uh, it's like our, it's our like final chance before we have to go off chip. So it's like, um, it's okay if we incur a little bit more cost. These are great questions, by the way. And this is definitely the, the line of thinking that uh, definitely you want to be, be in as we're discussing these different options. Okay. Um, so let's talk about cache line size now. 
how big should our cache line be? We talked last time about the fact that our cache line is going to be more than just a single word or, or whatever. So why is bigger better? Why would, why would a bigger cache line be a better idea? Well, it's going to exploit more spatial locality. If we're accessing an array um, of chars, for example, we pull in and we pull in a hundred characters and our, our string is also like a hundred. Well, we're gonna have one miss and then all the rest is gonna be hit because we can just access the next values from our cache line. So that's good. Um, and it's effectively a, a preset that we don't have to do anything. We, 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 uh, we, we get the prefetch for free. We're allowed to just get, get the data that we're gonna access next. Um, and we don't have to explicitly ask for it. But that's not all great. Um, smaller is often better as well um, because this focuses on temporal locality. Uh, if you access, if your access pattern is fairly random, but like, uh, rep repetitive, um, this is maybe more advantageous for you um, because if there's not much spatial locality, if you pull in a really large cache line, it's going to be a waste of space. You only access one out of like however many uh, bytes that you pulled in. That's not an effective use of your cache space. You're wasting all the rest. Um, in practice, generally, um, 32 to 64 bytes is what is uh, considered good for L1, where we really just care about latency. And it's OK if like, we can't take advantage of the massive spatial locality. Um, and then we let, we let kind of the, the larger caches help us with that spatial locality. Um, because quite frankly, like, memory is kind of it's it's more random than we would like as far as the access pattern goes because most applications that do anything that people want end up having mm, slightly annoying memory access pattern okay so that's cache line size and here's a little diagram of like kind of how it, uh, it affects the miss rate, the different sizes of, um, of blocks and the different sizes of cache uh, on, this, on this axis, the miss rate is over here. Or I, actually, sorry, these are, these are the, the lines, you know, this one's for 256K cache and then going on, okay. Um, I think this is the last last slide. So data verse and instruction cache. Um, one thing that we may uh, you may observe in a lot of processors is that there's two different caches: one for instructions and one for data. Does anybody have an idea why this might be the case? So that one's not evicting the other all the time? So one's not evicting the other all the time? Yep, that's a good one. Uh, instructions are pretty much always a read. Yeah, exactly. That's also the case. Um, yeah, anything else? Any, Kyle? Sure, so potentially a security security thing as well, probably not as much, but um, yeah, definitely a consideration. Uh, locality of some sort? Locality, locality of some sort, yeah. Yeah, these are all great answers and I agree with all of them. Um, there's, a, there's a few things that uh, I wanna highlight. First of all, there's different areas of memory generally. And this goes kind of, um, uh, what Kyle was saying, right? Like the, the start of your programs, a bunch of uh, a static data potentially, or you know, your, your kind of like program, it's instructions itself will be in one part and then you have the rest of your memory um, 
elsewhere. So there's some separation of like where it actually is. And if we have them both act in the same cache, they're gonna like stomp on each other potentially. Um, and they have different access patterns. So instruction cache accesses tend to have a lot of spatial locality because most of the time we're just gonna access instructions one by one in sequence. You know, we'll just execute instruction one, execute instruction two. It's very, it, you know, it really can take advantage of spatial locality. Um, it's also more predictable, you know, uh, as in so much as branches are predictable, which is, we'll talk about that later, but you know, we can reasonably predict uh, branches. Um, so, that's good, right? Like there's not any other random factors that can affect how we, uh, um, uh, the predictability of instruction accesses. However, data cache accesses are typically less predictable because, you know, applications are unpredictable in general, and especially nowadays, right? where we have everything allocated in the heap because we can, this is even more the case. And this goes to, I think it was Amelia um, who had this comment, like they could interfere with each other. They can contend for the same bit of cash. And that's not good, um, right? Our sequential instruction accesses could interfere with our data accesses um, and vice versa. and obviously getting, giving them their own sandbox to play in will help alleviate that issue. Okay, any questions? So let's talk about project one. All right, so first thing, um, individual project, if you can already tell from like the bold here, um, what you'll be doing is you'll be writing a simulator which simulates cache replacement policies uh, in four different ones, um, or three, sorry. Um, and they're the, they're the three ones that we said were possible to implement in class today. The first one being LRU, random, and then LRU preferred clean is the last one. So these were the three that we talked about uh, way back up here. Besides farthest further use, because like we said, that's impossible. I mean, actually it's technically possible since you have access to the trace file, but like, let's pretend that you don't, it's a string. All right, so that's the, that's the overall uh, concept here. Um, I recommend diving on Linux because I have no idea how to make this work. I assume it probably works on other platforms, but you know, you're on your own. Um, the rubric is here. Most of the points are for LRU because it's the more tip, most typical one. Then random is fairly trivial, and LRU prefer clean is not too bad once you've implemented LRU. So if you're trying to figure out where should I start, I would start with random so you can get 20 free points, and then go and start implementing LRU, and uh, that's that's where I would go. Um, this note is important, like, don't submit more than three times unless you tell me. Um, if you need more submissions, just let me know and we can work something out. But it'll give you a zero provisionally if you do submit more than three times. And basically all this is doing is making sure that you don't use grade scope as your test environment. 
which is not the point of grade scope. Um, this section here, cash simulation, discusses um, how the simulation should behave um, and kind of some basic stuff about how it takes an input and output. It, it should just use standard in and standard out for everything. Um, and as noted here, most of the input output, I think all of the input output is handled by the starter code. So you don't really have to worry about it if you choose to use the starter code. Um, if you don't want to use the starter code, if you want to write it in some other language, because you know you like Haskell or Rust or something, you can, but you just have to make sure you're fulfilling all of the requirements. Um, and it's they're they're listed all down below. Um, so this cache simulation behavior describes how the simulation should behave. If let me go over to the source real quick. Um, and, and kind of show you where this is in the actual code. If we go to cache system and scroll down to cache system mem access, um, if you kind of read through this, this corresponds um, to what is what is described over here. We determine whether or not it's a cache hit. Okay, this is a little bit too small. Um, we determine if it's a cache hit or a miss. And if it is a miss, then we have to calculate where it needs to be stored. That's this, uh, that's this part here. Um, we have to determine if an eviction is necessary. So that's our, our cache size is too, too big, or our cache, our cache set is too full or full. There's no, no such thing as too full, just full or not. Um, and then and then we also have to. Um, uh, update update the tag with the new one, which is down here. And then on the hit, then we we just this is just some statistics. Um. Oh, and yeah, the, uh, we have to we have to keep track of whether or not we've modified if the current cash uh, if the cash line is modified or not. And this goes back to the whole thing about the dirty versus clean, this is where we keep track of it. If it's a if it's a write, then we set the status to modified, indicating that we'll have to write this back. So this is a write back cache simulation. And then the replacement policy state must be updated. And that's what this is here. Um, and this is all in the starter code. So I'm just telling you like if if you want all of your a lot of the work done already, then just use the starter code. What you do have to implement is the replacement policies. It's pretty important that you at least look at the comments in this file. They're fairly extensive and they describe how you're supposed to structure a replacement policy. It is a, um, it is a struct uh, that defines the functions that are necessary for a replacement policy. So it, it's a fun this function, um, you know, tells it, it will be called when we need to figure out which line to evict. This one gets called when we um, uh, actually access a cache line. And then this last one is um, a cleanup function so that you can, you can clean up the any memory that you have, and then you can store any data in void star. When you're dealing with void star, just make sure to cast it to whatever value it actually is when you access it. It's kind of the, the trick there. Um, okay. Let me let me show you the replacement policies.c as well. Um, each each different policy has its own kind of section. So this is the L oh here LRU replacement policy, um, and then scrolling down, you have the random one, and then down over here LRU prefer clean. And 
uh, these last ones are constructors. They're kind of already filled out. Um, I've already allocated the replacement policy and set the po function pointer. So you can allocate additional memory, and then you have to also implement the actual functions themselves. Um, Yeah, I don't think you really have to know too much about function pointers besides that, like, that's what these are. Because um, all the times that I call the function pointers, I think they're already in the starter code. So um, there's two other to do's outside of the replacement policies.c that you have to deal with. First of all, this cache system find cache line, um, which is just going to say, given a, the, the set and the tag go find the line and give a pointer to it or return null if it's uh, not in the cache and up here um, you have to calculate the number of index bits the offset bits and the tag bits as, as we've uh, got some practice with last lecture and then there's two things in main.c as well you have to calculate the line size and the number of sets from the cache size the cache lines and the associativity okay um there's some instructions here there's a piazza post as well about how to get the source this is what i recommend if you don't want to use git you can download the tarball if you want to use Git, you can do all of these instructions. Um, this is probably what you care the most about. I have an auto grader script because I have too much time on my hands, or actually I have too little time on my hands, but I use it badly. Um, and guess what? The starter code currently doesn't implement it correctly. So it is currently going to give you a zero out of 42. Um, and that's obviously expected because none of this stuff is implemented, but you can use this greater script and it'll run it against all of the sample inputs and corresponding outputs and tell you whether or not it's passing. Um, and then when you upload to grade scope as well, it'll it'll do the same. It'll it'll run the same script with more inputs and outputs. So it's not the complete set that we've given you. Um, so for example, this is what you would see on grade scope. Actually, you wouldn't see this part, but you would see all of this stuff down here where you're getting two points for each one of the ones passing. Um, and there's there's a lot. So, you know, just be aware of that. Okay. I think I've done enough rambling. Any questions about the project? When is the due date? Uh, it's different on Kansas and grade scope. Yeah, that's probably the case. Um, let's see, what is today? Today's the eighth, let's make the 22nd. I don't, I don't think this is an especially hard project, especially with the starter code. Um, so let's go with the 22nd. Other questions? Oh, uh, you can, okay, where is it? Down here. Here's an example of how to run it if you don't want to use a greater skip because it's being slow or something. You can you can uh, use standard in redirection to just pass the, uh, the input in on standard in. And that's, that's an example. Um, of what it does. Obviously, the seg fault because, like I said, nothing's implemented. So it's trying to, I think, I don't know what it's trying to do, but it's, 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 not, it's not good. Almost happy birthday. Thank you.
Um, oh, one other thing. Uh, so only lines that start with output matter. Where is that? Here. So if you want to add debugging lines, because you know, you're know you trying to figure out if the program's working, go ahead, knock yourself out. They won't affect it as long as they don't start with the literal string output. Okay, so feel free to see out or print out or whatever, all that you want. Um, that's not going to be not going to be graded. Literally, just have a a regex match. Make sure that it starts with output, and then this is all done for you. So if you use the starter code, you don't even have to worry about that part. All right. If there aren't any more questions, let's talk about homework one. Homework one. So there was a question about problem three. Um, and I don't remember what the question was. Was it just like how to approach it? Who was, who had that question? Oh yeah, that was me. I wasn't really sure where to start with this one. Um, I would start kind of like any word problem from like high school and look at a few things. First of all, um, this new memory improves your memory subsystem so that the memory latencies are reduced by a factor of 3.5. So what does that mean? Well, it tells you that the latency of the old one so this old memory subsystem is 3.5 times the latency of the new one. And then kind of you can continue with the rest of the sentences. This tells you how much of the time of your new, of your new one is working on, is waiting for memory. And then you can solve because of math for the old system as well. And as far as the explanation, just ex, you know, explain as much as is necessary to make it clear where you're getting the numbers from and, and why the numbers are the way they are. Um, and that should be that should be good. Yes, question. I think you're overthinking it. So when we were talking about, uh, so the question was, how do we, how do we get this? How do we compute the, the decrease in core frequency? Um, what I'm looking for here, I guess I should maybe clarify is that I'm looking for a ratio, like a percentage. Like obviously you can't give me an exact number because I haven't given the exact number of the original core frequency, but think about how you could, compute a percentage reduction um, of your clock speed that will then produce um, the same performance even with, with this 60% uh, parallelization. Um, 
and it, it, it kind of goes I mean a, a hint is like think about think about the speed up and from each of these kind of individually so the speed up of this 60 percent parallelization and the speed up of reducing core frequency okay any other questions all right you guys are dismissed um i will see you on wednesday <laughs>